Hello and welcome to the web panel of the Delphi Economic Forum on Latest Developers in the Eastern Mediterranean. My name is Ioannis Grigoriadis and I am an Associate Professor at Bilhik University Ankara and a Senior Researcher at the Hellenic Foundation for European Foreign Policy. I'm honored to moderate a panel on a very interesting uh, moment. Uh, which is the pandemic moment. It is the pandemic crisis that has uh, affected our lives in so many fundamental ways. And it's also affected politics in the Eastern Mediterranean region. I'm delighted to have with me today four distinguished experts uh, that will discuss with us uh, uh, their views on how the latest global developments have affected politics in the Eastern Mediterranean. So, in alphabetic order, we have uh, Thanos Dokos, Alternate National Security Advisor to the Greek Prime Minister, uh, Natalie Tocci, Director for the Institute of Fire Internationale in Rome and an Honorary Professor at the University of Tübingen, Sinan Ulgen, Executive Chairman of uh, the Think Tank Adam in Istanbul, and Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President of the Atlantic Council in the United States. So, I would like first to give the floor uh, in alphabetical order to Thanos Dokos. Uh, Thanos, what do you think that is the most profound uh, effect of the pandemic crisis on politics of the Eastern Mediterranean? Well, first of all, it's, it's good to be in a panel with friends, although we're not in physical proximity. Uh, but that's a, at least a substitute. Uh, well, th the first thing I see is empty airports, empty hotels and empty beaches at a time where that shouldn't be the case. Uh, and that goes for a number of countries which will be hurt uh, by, by the pandemic. Hopefully it will not be a lost season for all of us, but it remains to be seen. Um, what I see in, in, in terms of, of security developments, um, business as usual, and I'm not saying that in any positive way. Um, the Mediterranean continues to be a contested space. Probably it looks more like a G0 region. Um, multiple state and non-state actors are active, but no one seems to be in charge. Uh, and especially those that are of most interest to a country like Greece, which is the EU, um, it has a strategy and Natalie played uh, a fundamental role in preparing this, uh, but we don't seem to be active players, at least not as much as we should be. Uh, there's too much disagreement, reflection, but little action on the part of the EU. So we are, well, not exactly observers, but close to that. And as far as the US goes, well, um, we have the health crisis, the economic crisis as a result of that, uh, the uh, Floyd affair, the elections coming, um, the escalation of the relationship with China. All this means that little U.S. leadership uh, is expected in the Eastern Met. Now, uh, and we have, uh, unfortunately, a long list of problems. Uh, Libya, uh, the fighting has escalated no good solution inside. Um, hopefully uh, th there will be an understanding between the two fighting uh, sides, but that is not the case as we speak. Syria continues to be a problem. Fortunately, limited um, flows, uh, migration and refugee flows, although uh, Italy remains a, a factor which could change things. Energy uh, which has been a very contentious issue over the past few years in the Eastern Med, there, ha there seems to be a slowdown uh, in, in the activities of, of companies uh, 
perhaps because of the very low prices of uh, of hydrocarbons, uh, but we still have tension. Uh, and coming to perhaps my my last point, um, there is um, high tension between Greece and Turkey. We had the uh, Evros um, crisis in uh, in uh, March. There seems to be um, escalating situation as we speak because of uh, the limitation of maritime zones and possible exploration of hydrocarbons. Um, not the kind of relationship one would have expected, especially as the uh, COVID-19 crisis is still unfolding. And one could have expected perhaps a bit more cooperation uh, from countries in the region to try to get out of this crisis with uh, as little damage as possible. That's not what we have seen so far. So um, the Eastern Med is still in a very uh, fluid um, situation. No regional security architecture. We had the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum established um, some time ago. Um, perhaps the uh, basis of a regional security architecture, of course, there is an important ingredient missing, and this is Turkey. Um, it has difficult relations with many other regional countries, uh, but perhaps we should try to think out of the box and find ways to cooperate and in integrate Turkey um, into what is happening in the Eastern Med. Not easy, uh, but um, the, the situation uh, the, the will remain incomplete as long as we have this conflicting relationship. So let me stop at this point and... Um, yeah, thank you very much, you. Sano. Uh, thank you. Uh, Natalie, you've been instrumental in promoting this discussion on European security strategy. So how do you look into the development uh, like uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean and in, in the context of the pandemic? Of course, the pandemic is a security crisis of another dimension, but the Eastern Mediterranean was already in a, a region where several security crises were unfolding when the uh, health security crisis develops. So uh, what is your take on the current state of affairs? Well, I think I very much start in the same way as Thanos did, uh, in doubt that uh, especially in a post-COVID-19 East Med, uh, this really does look like a G0 world. Now, and often what is said about COVID-19 is that it tends to accelerate dynamics. I think in this particular case, it both accelerates one set of dynamics as well as reverses, possibly reverses others, uh, particularly if we look at the East Med from a, from a global perspective. Now, I think it accelerates a U.S. departure from the region. It has not caused it, but in the context of COVID-19, COVID-19, the United States has not exactly excelled at global leadership. Uh, and what I found most striking about it is that it is not a question of the US being opposed. Um, it is far more a question of the United States being missing in action uh, at, at the global level. And I think that, as I said, it's not something that began uh, with COVID-19, particularly if we think about uh, the East Med. Uh, we as Europeans, for instance, have been, we as Italians, uh, have been kind of uh, asking the United States to be, for instance, more involved in Libya. And the United States has been very telling us that it uh, has absolutely no intention of, of doing so. Uh, it has very, been very clear the way in which which the United States uh, has not been uh, particularly active uh, in Syria. And therefore, the way in which a US, uh, uh, I wouldn't say disengagement, because the presence of the United States, particularly when it comes to the Middle East, perhaps less so in the Mediterranean, is still there. But it's a presence that is less able to um, affect outcome. So it's a presence that does not automatically translate into power. Now, in this respect, you can see COVID-19 accelerating these trends. On the other hand, uh, and this is perhaps slightly more speculative, but I also think that a post-COVID-19 is um, uh, going to see less China in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and what I mean by this is that if it is true that globalization is going to change in nature, that we're going to see shorter global supply chains, 
uh, we may well end up seeing a globalization which is more regional, uh, more, a more regionalized globalization. And in a more regionalized globalization, um, this will obviously impact possibly quite heavily the whole ethos and feasibility of the Belt and Road, which of course have been the main initiative, the main geoeconomic and geostrategic initiative through which uh, China had pushed westwards, uh, including in the Eastern Mediterranean. So if basically you have the sort of two major global powers, which are, I wouldn't say completely absent from the scene, but uh, with uh, reducing influence uh, on the region, then obviously one asks oneself what is left. Now what is left is Europe and the regional pl uh, players. Now uh, the problem of course is that uh, Anastanos was very much uh, uh, pointing out, and I, I very much agree, um, Europe has certainly um, uh, been fairly clear on what its overall strategy and objectives are. I don't think there's, frankly speaking, a lot of work that needs to be done in order to re refine that further. The main problem when it comes to the European Union is that it has been up to it in terms of implementing uh, that vision, uh, both in terms of acquiring the necessary capabilities of being more present and above all, uh, sort of garnering the will uh, in order to act um, and this has been very clear if we take, for instance, Libya, uh, the way in which in the context of Libya, uh, a uh, absent United States, uh, a uh, present in words but not in action, uh, European Union, largely because of our divisions, but I wouldn't say it's only about of our divisions. I think it's largely due to our unwillingness to actually put uh, not our perhaps money in this case, but our boots uh, where our mouth is. Uh, and this has obviously left a void, uh, and it's a void that, as we know very well, has been filled by uh, regional players, beginning with Russia, with Turkey, UAE, and of course, uh, Egypt as well. Now, at this point, if we take the case of Libya, what's our best bet? Well, it's kind of one of these situations in which it almost becomes a bit too late for us to take decisive action. We almost have to hope that Russia and Turkey, two regional players, um, end up coming to a compromise, which is not going to be our compromise, uh, because it seems very clear to me that the only compromise that they might be interested in is one of freezing a conflict uh, rather than resolving it. But of course, freezing a conflict is better than having an active conflict. Huh? Uh, so the question really is whether that push in Libya is going to eventually be stronger than a uh, UAE Egyptian push to have an all out victory uh, of Haftar. But assuming that a Russia Turkey push is strong enough to have a ceasefire, which, as I said, would not be intended uh, to peace, uh, the question is whether the, the European Union would be able to get into the nooks and crannies of that relationship uh, in order to then eventually shift it. Uh, towards a more constructive direction. In order to do so, of course, words are insufficient. Uh, it is very clear that in order to do so, action is necessary. And as I said, it has to be a willingness uh, not only to talk autonomy, uh, but to do autonomy as well. So this is when, it, as, as far as, if you like, the, the EU's general approach, and one could apply it to different situations, obviously, in the East Med. I just took the Libya case as an example here. The second point and, and last point that I wanted to raise is really one about um, the way in which the European Union understands these regional relationships. Uh, now, it is very clear that, you know, which, which are the regional players that we're talking about? We're clearly talking about, in the first instance, uh, Turkey, Iran, uh, Russia, uh, sort of slightly uh, uh, lower in terms of, if you like, regional significance, uh, Israel, UAE, Egypt. Uh, and it, it is very clear that unless the EU is able, not only through its bilateral re-understanding uh, and reconstruction of those relationships, re-understanding, uh, reconstruction of those relationships, attempt to affect the regional dynamics between these players, it is going to be unable to play a meaningful role. And I think this, uh, and I'll only pick the Turkey case because in many respects it would be, uh, it, it is I think the most significant and also because I wouldn't have time to go through all of them. Uh, but I really do think that the time has come for the EU to change its lens it looks at Turkey. Uh, uh, it is very clear that uh, there is a necessary change of lens when it comes to migration. 
uh, what happened at the beginning of this year in many respects uh, highlights the fact that what has been a Turkish threat or rather uh, an Erdogan threat vis-a-vis -vis migration to Europe is of course to an extent meaningful but to a large extent empty. Uh, in a sense, we know that the emperor has no clothes uh, and therefore allowing uh, this relationship to just uh, develop in a transactional manner, ultimately because of a fear that the EU has had uh, since 2015, has not, has on the one hand, not served the European Union well, and on the other hand, has revealed to be largely empty. Second change of lens when it comes to Turkey is really reconsidering what is a gift and what is not a gift. Uh, and understanding that uh, some things that we understand as being a gift to Turkey, such as, for instance, uh, moving towards a modernized customs union, uh, are not actually a real gift. Uh, well, they are a gift to Turkey, they're not a gift to Erdogan. Uh, but so long as we understand them as a gift to the Turkish president, we're going to be, uh, if you like, victims of our own analysis and our own understanding of the situation, uh, and essentially be giving Erdogan the ultimate gift that he wants which is essentially that of saying that he should move in a constructive direction with the European Union, but not acting uh, to that effect. Uh, and then third, and obviously related to this, a change of lens in really separating and making the distinction of what is Erdogan and what is Turkey. Uh, and understanding that the interests of one and of the other actually do not always and necessarily coincide. And when we develop our policies towards Turkey, and develop policies towards Turkey and not merely towards Erdogan. Now, the reason why I put so much emphasis on Turkey, and this is where I'll end, is because if it is true that the United States is progressively disengaging itself from the, from the region, and therefore in many respects, we will have a Turkey which is increasingly unmoored uh, in the region. And it is no coincidence that over the last years we have seen uh, Russia particularly uh, uh, essentially using this unmooring of Turkey to its own advantage. So if there isn't a United States which basically reigns Turkey in because of its own changing global leadership uh, role, then it is very clear that unless the European Union does it, uh, Turkey simply not keep on only doing what it's always done, which is basically act in a very transactional sort of lone wolf way. But because ultimately the, if you like, balance of power between Turkey and Russia is so much skewed towards the latter, uh, ultimately the uh, overall direction this is going to take is certainly not going to be to the EU's advantage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Sinan, uh, Natalie spoke about the unmooring of Turkey from the West or from the United States. And Turkey is involved in virtually all the issues, the disputes that have been transpiring in the Eastern Mediterranean. So uh, what is your uh, evaluation of the current state of affairs? Is Turkey really overplaying its hand by getting engaged into too many uh, disputes at the same time, is there an opportunity for resolving or uh, sort of freezing conflicts and bringing Turkey closer to its European neighbors and the European Union? Uh, well, uh, first of all, many thanks for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, with friends. Um, now, in order to really understand and to conceptualize where Turkey stands today, I think it's useful to take a look at uh, the evolution of Turkish foreign policy over perhaps the last five years. What we see increasingly, I mean, the terminology that Natalie has used uh, was, you know, being unmoored. Yes, there is definitely some of that. Uh, that is not a new phenomenon in the sense, uh, especially with regard to Europe. There is uh, such a disillusionment uh, with Europe that at the political level, the unmooring had already happened uh, quite some time ago. Uh, you, you see that very clearly uh, the, that, you know, despite, uh, you know, paying lip service to accession uh, right now, uh, the EU has absolutely no leverage uh, on Turkish behavior. Uh, so, and that, you know, stands in stark contrast uh, to the state of relationship when you know a decade ago uh, the the accession relationship was on track and the negotiations were ongoing 
So within a decade, uh, we very much moved uh, in, a, in a very different position. Uh, and so the unmooring already happened. Secondly, what we also see in the last few years, and this is something that uh, you know traces back to the uh, uh, to the conflict in Syria, is a proclivity uh, for the Turkish leadership uh, to shift to a mode of hard power. Uh, now, traditionally, uh, Turkey, at least at the beginning of the, of the decade, put much more emphasis on soft power. So much so that. Now, if we go back again 10 years ago, at the onset of the Arab Spring, there was talk about the Turkish model, and that was, you know, par excellence, uh, the soft power of Turkey. Today, we live in an environment where the Turkish leadership actually emphasizes the hard power component. This, uh, to some extent, was by necessity in Syria as Turkey got exposed to the security spillovers from Syria and uh, became entangled uh, with the conflict in Syria. But increasingly also by choice, uh, and this is what we see in Eastern Mediterranean and Libya. The interesting part also here is that this choice of conducting foreign policy on the basis of hard power also seems to have uh, captivated the support of the Turkish domestic opinion public opinion. So it is something more than, you know, purely uh, government policy. It is something that uh, has indeed received support, especially since Turkey seems to have uh, won uh, zones of influence uh, or uh, achieved uh, at least some of its ambitions uh, in a geography like Libya. Uh, with a minimal investment in its hard power, uh, but uh, in return getting quite a bit of uh, political influence on the ground. So uh, I think this is the trend that needs to be uh, underlined uh, as we are watching where Turkey is moving. And I think the implications for Europe uh, in terms of you know what to do next in the post-COVID environment are twofold. One, and here I would very much uh, second uh, Natalie's thoughts, is that we really have to review uh, the framework of the relationship between Turkey and the EU, because right now uh, this is a very dysfunctional relationship. It's become you know, only a, a, a transactional relationship. And as a result, the EU has lost really all leverage. This is something that I've tried to outline before as well. So if the EU wants to have an impact on Turkish behavior, whether it is in the Eastern Mediterranean, whether it's in Libya, whether it has to do in, on Cyprus and so on, or even the bilateral issues with Greece, there, needs, there really needs to be uh, a, a, a time to rebuild this relationship into something more positive. So we really have to enrich this relationship you know, and here I'm not even talking about the goal of accession that can remain or that can, you know, be, be debated. But fundamentally, we have to enrich the relationship with some positive aspects. Right now, the way that Ankara looks at the EU is basically, you know, uh, either, you know, a source of money for the refugees, uh, but uh, very little else uh, for the time being, because all the tracks of movement in this relationship have stalled. The accession has stalled, customs union has stalled, visa liberalization has stalled, and so on and so forth. So I think this is what needs to happen. And as long as the EU continues on this track of, uh, you know, penalizing or trying to penalize Turkey for some of the, you know, diplomatic maneuvers that is not to its liking, we fall back into this trap of uh, basically uh, failing to build a relationship uh, that is anything uh, but transactional relationship. Uh, and as a result of which, what is likely to happen a few years down the road is that this trend of seeing you know, an important country, a neighbor like Turkey, moving away from soft power, soft power to hard power that is the trend that the EU is likely to cement through its own mistakes. And I think this is where I want to end. Thank you very much, Sinan. Damon, we've been already starting a discussion about United States withdrawal from the Eastern Mediterranean and the globe in general. So 
What is your take on uh, the American foreign policy in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, under the Trump administration? And my follow-up question would be, would the elections matter? So would the, a Biden administration mean a fundamental shift in America's view of the Eastern Mediterranean? Sure, thank you. First of all, let's, let me say how pleased I am to that the Delphi Economic Forum is moving forward virtually and how pleased I am to be joining again this year. Um, and let me also begin uh, this conversation with a dose of humility. Uh, my country right now is going through a really tough time, uh, a tough time that it's easy for foreign observers to say, how is the United States even relevant to what's happening in a place like the Eastern Mediterranean? And so I do come to this with a sense of humility because if we're going to lead globally, if we're going to be an example of inspiration in the world, we have to fix ourselves at home. The United States has historically been influential in the world because our society, the way we work, has been a source of inspiration. Our values, our commitment to freedom have been what have actually magnified our power. Uh, it's not just hard, that hard power is amplified by the soft power of the example. And so first and foremost, anything, uh, any conversation about the United States and the Eastern Mediterranean has to begin with a sense of humility that we're at a low point right now. Uh, but one thing I do know is that uh, we're structured in a way that our systems are open. Uh, they retain legitimacy because of our people, and we are a self-correcting system. We don't need others to tell us uh, where our shortcomings are, although you're few. Um, that's the wrenching debate we're having right now. And I say that because that's ultimately a source of our strength. And so the United States' role in the Eastern Mediterranean is a strangely countervailing set of circumstances. In many respects, at a strategic level, we have one of the most coherent approaches to the Eastern Mediterranean uh, that you could argue has been articulated by a foreign policy community uh, in quite a few decades. But at the same time, many of you have, have already noted on this panel, there is a glaring sense of, of absence uh, and perhaps irrelevance to some of the biggest issues unfolding. So let me unpack that briefly. Um, you know, I think uh, the history of this region, the United States is, is deeply uh, embedded and committed. It is you know, it is because of uh, coming out of 1945, the Turkish state's crisis, the, the Greek Civil War that led to uh, America's role in the world, the Truman Doctrine, that catalyzed the creation of NATO, and that through a bold decision of American leadership to bring Greece and Turkey into the alliance, transformed the way that Southeast Europe played out during the Cold War uh, uh, in a really remarkable way. Um, and so... Um, the zone of geostrategic competition isn't new for this region, but it has returned. It's returned beginning in 2014 in Crimea, the Russian presence in, Black, in the Black Sea, uh, in 2015 in Syria, and how that has just metastasized into one of uh, the worst tragedies uh, facing our planet. Uh, we've seen Russian-Chinese cooperation, a Chinese presence in, in the Mediterranean, and we've seen some increasing concerns around issues of nonproliferation, uh, migratory flows, WMD, we've had incidents where the U.S. has been engaged very much so in trying to control the flow of weapons of mass destruction or illicit fight flows in the region. Uh, these are real issues. And despite, um, despite the perception of the United States not being there, we've actually seen a pretty remarkable apogee in U.S.-Greek relations over the past decade, growing out of the sense of despair in Greece, first of all, uh, during the the financial crisis, uh, but something that's really been bipartisan in Greece and really bipartisan in the United States to put the, the relationship in one of the strongest footings we've had uh, ever. We've also seen a real commitment here at a strategic level on understanding how we need to have a stronger strategic anchor among the democracies in the region. You've seen very explicit efforts. You've seen an East Med strategy uh, even from uh, this administration with Wes Mitchell, who drove it when he was in office, of really stepping up coordination with Greece, the Republic of Cyprus, uh, Israel, uh, paralleled and accompanied with a real commitment to retaining and keeping Turkey as an ally and as part of the strategic West. It's a plagued issue. It's a troubled issue. It's a troubled relationship. It's faced tensions, obviously, first and foremost in Syria, but elsewhere but it has remained um, part of what's unfolding. So we see these countervailing forces. The fundamental ones are big picture. A President Tr Trump 
uh, building on even an expression of President Obama of ending the wars, where you see an instinct of restraint at the political level, which means we don't really want to be, we don't want to own the problem in Syria or, or own the problem in Libya. There's an intentional backing away from American responsibility for those with an expectation that regional actors and the European Union have responsibility first and foremost, and that our role can be supporting. Uh, you've seen um, uh, uh, the sense of energy sufficiency and independence in the United States um, also help underscore that there is a lessened dependence of the United States on the broader uh, region uh, in economic and energy terms. And yet at the same time, we've seen overwhelming bipartisan support for an East Med Act, uh, for a power projection capability, which is unparalleled. Um, it's not as if we've left Suda Bay, uh, our drone operations in, in Greece, our naval operations in Crete. Insulik is a pillar of American power projection, Aviano in Italy, along with the, probably the most developed security cooperation we've had, not only with, with Greece, but Israel, with Egypt, and, and especially what is a new caliber, the Republic of Cyprus, and a real commitment from the new OPEC, the, the Overseas Development Finance Corporation, to look to put billions of dollars into the region in a way that can catalyze private sector investment. So we're a mess. We don't have strategic clarity. We've lost some moral leadership right now. Our elections will matter. Vice President Biden knows this region well. Look at his team from Tony Blinken to Nick Burns. They know this region well. And so we're going to be distracted. This will not be our first priority. The burden will be on your shoulders, on the region's shoulders, on the European Union. But it would be short-sighted to count us out, even as it would be misplaced to depend on us. You can see the elements of a strategy that could come together, and I'll close with this, that would be a recommitment after we get through this year, our elections, on how we keep the alliance with Turkey strong, working with a common goal with Greece to keep Turkey in the strategic West in that partnership, how to continue to bolster democracies and accord into a way against autocracies working with Greece, Republic of Cyprus, Israel, um, how to continue to advance new solutions on the island of Cyprus, and how to multilateralize the framework in the Eastern Mediterranean around economic and energy, and around the security issues of proliferation, migration, weapons of mass destruction, illicit flows, which really do matter. Um, so there's space that we can come back to this with a strategic entry, uh, but it just won't happen in the next couple of weeks and months, that's for sure. Thank you very much, Damon. I think a very important point you raised is the need to multilateralize uh, the discussion and the sort of addressing the issues and the conflicts in a way that is inclusive and not exclusive, and it, in a way that can involve many as many actors as possible in the region and those global actors interested in the region depending on their domestic uh, of course situation as well but as you've already all of you have uh, raised uh, in the short term the man managing the economic effects of the crisis and the pandemic itself is likely to be a priority so uh, i would like to hear your very short comment on how things could develop uh, in the realm of economy, which, which I think is the first emergency that everybody's facing right now. So Turkey has been very vulnerable, like there have been all these discussions about how to meet its uh, foreign debt obligations. Uh, Greece and Turkey are fundamentally uh, like influenced by tourism flows, so like the expected flow, uh, flow like the expected decrease in tourism revenue is going to affect them and of course the european union is, uh, is facing a major challenge in order to help the countries that have been fundamentally and stronger affected by the crisis in a way that doesn't uh, destroy the internal uh, structure and the solidarity within the member states so thanos what do you think is uh, Greece's first priority in that respect? Well, first of all, um, we expect some clarifications about the EU's package. Um, mm -hmm. 
everyone is hoping that there will be generous terms. I suspect this is also an issue of high interest for Italy as well. Uh, so this is one of the priorities. What will be the terms and how to use that money as wisely and efficiently as possible? Number two is, of course, as you mentioned, Jan, is tourism. Um, and I suspect, and that goes for Turkey as well, I think the last thing we would need is to scare away uh, those tourists that still intend to travel during the summer uh, by raising the tensions in, in the Aegean and the Eastern Med. So I, I think that both countries would benefit from a calm summer um, extending to, to, to fall. Um, and then, of course, I, I take Natalie's point about regional globalization. Perhaps we, if, if this is going to be the case, we need to explore uh, prospects for economic cooperation uh, in the sub-region. No specific ideas, but I think this is something worth exploring uh, in the weeks and months to come. Sinan, do you think that uh, the economic situation in Turkey is going to affect the Turkish foreign policy in the Eastern Mediterranean? Because you've mentioned how domestic opinion matters now, right? So I suspect that that would be a very important point to, to follow. Yes, absolutely. I mean, on the surface, uh, you know, one could claim that, you know, as uh, countries get into um, economic hardship, uh, they look to divert attention uh, towards, you know, uh, foreign uh, policy challenges. Uh, so that could be the outcome for Turkey as well. But I would argue that this is not, you know, an inevitable consequence. Uh, when, uh, you know, if you want to be a bit more intellectual about it, uh, rather than superficial, I could claim that here there is an opportunity for the EU, actually, uh, because what is happening uh, in, you know, in the EU countries, but also in the in, you know, neighborhood, is an unprecedented economic shock. And we will, we are seeing uh, some, you know, very substantive increases in uh, you know, in, in unemployment, uh, in decreases in welfare. And uh, this is definitely an area where, you know, in a post-COVID environment, the EU could uh, also restructure its economic commitments to. And this would be one way of rebuilding the type of leverage that I've tried to underline at the beginning and rebuilding the type of, you know, positive agenda between Turkey and the EU. Uh, by uh, and this is this should not certainly be focalized or centralized on Turkey, but there will be a need for you know many other countries uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, for this type of approach. Uh, and uh, the, the second, perhaps um, you know, theme that I want to underline very briefly is this regional uh, deglobalization or regional globalization. Indeed, we do hear and read a lot about the fact that. Uh, companies now want to diversify away from China. They want to build more resilient supply chains. And therefore, you know, Europe's neighborhood uh, could indeed be a beneficiary of this trend, uh, especially countries like Turkey that has a vast industrial infrastructure. Uh, but here as well, I think this is not going to happen on its own. And there is, there is a need for deeper thinking among the policy elites in, in the EU about what is it that they want to do to facilitate this trend and what is the role for public action in this type of uh, objective because fundamentally these are market players so it is ultimately up to them to decide whether they want to do you know to continue their large scale investments in china but obviously there's a role for public policy if there is indeed a goal of trying to transfer some of those investments to regions that are much closer to Europe. And that could also be yet another area where the Turkey-EU relationship uh, could find uh, new strength. Thank you very much, Sinan. We have about two minutes left, so I would like to apologize from Damon and give the last floor to Natalie on a very short comment on how the EU has very been faring through the crisis. 
Very, very yes. briefly. Um, I would say that if we compare to the Eurozone crisis, which is our, if you like, last point of reference, uh, the EU has been doing incomparably better. Now, you could say it doesn't take much, and I would agree with that. Um, but indeed, after a slow start, when it comes to uh, the EU's internal response, meaning response to itself, uh, it's quite clear that we're uh, sort of putting in place not only significant bridging mechanisms from the uh, 750 billion of the European Central Bank, uh, the Shore Programme, the European Investment Bank Programme, the reformed European Stability Mechanism, and above all, moving towards what uh, would could eventually, if we end up being good at negotiating this, uh, a very ambition uh, now called Next Generation EU Recovery and Resilience Programme. Uh, that would amount to, as per proposal of the European Commission, 750 billion, uh, 500 of, uh, uh, billion of which in grants. Now, extremely significant when it comes to the inside. Now, the problem, of course, is that uh, the economic crisis does not stop at the Schengen borders. And so the question really is, uh, how can the EU also pay uh, as attention to the outside, to its nature, especially in the players are unlikely to do so, as, as we were discussing. Very difficult to do the drone, and this is why I come back to the multilateral, uh, which is actually something that the EU is relatively good at doing. The question is, in my view, not only what the EU will be able to do bilaterally with neighboring regions, and here I completely agree with the points Sinan was making, but the extent to which it's going to be able to uh, mobilize multilateral forums, some in instance, uh, the duty to more effect uh, in coordinating a socio-economic response to the COVID-19 crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. And I would like to thank all panelists for their input into a very interesting discussion. And uh, I would like also to thank the Delphi Economic Forum for inviting me to moderate this discussion and I look forward to seeing you in person when permissions when uh, conditions permit thank you very much indeed thank, thank you, you Yanis.